Hello everyone, Elijah here again with my retro decor and tonight I'd like to share with you how I choose Chinese pod lessons. I mean, There's thousands of lessons, how do you sort through them, how do you know which ones you want to do. Well, tonight I'm going to cover a few topics. The first one is how I actually choose the lessons, which should only take a few seconds and that might be all you want to watch. But then I'm going to get into why I choose Chinese pod lessons that way. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Chinese pod system, how it works. I'm going to also talk about the traditional curriculum revision cycle, which Chinese pod was kind of a reaction against that. And then I'll talk about how Chinese pod took kind of like a factory approach to manufacturing the lessons and why that works and some of the troubles that Chinese pod has run into with doing that, and especially in terms of historical change. So let's get started. How I choose Chinese pod lessons. Okay, so here we are on the home page, the dashboard. Uh, at the very top, at least now in uh, January 2019, at the very top is a box called Latest Lessons. That is not how I choose lessons. Uh, down on the left side, there's a button that says More, and it brings you up other options, and one of them is Library List. This is what I use. This is the easiest way I have found to choose lessons on Chinese Pod. So let's say I'm a newbie. So I'll select newbie here under filter, newbie, all bookmark status, all studied status, date descending, I change that to ascending. So all newbie starting with the oldest. And what I'm looking at here is the publication date. And I scroll down to the bottom, I'm gonna jump way ahead, go to page six, it's 2016, page eight, 2017, Page 10 is also 2017. Let's go to page 12. Aha, okay, this is what I'm looking for. 2008 on page 12. First lesson in 2008 was before noon, afternoon, January 1st. I'm going to bookmark that. And then the next one. And then the next one. And the next one. And the next one. And the next one. And the next one. You, know, you look on the right. This uh, is studied. I've studied all of these before. So uh, let's go to the next page. And then I bookmark the next one and the next one. And I bet you know what I'm going to do with the next one and the one after that and the one after that. And I just keep going until I have bookmarked enough. Now how do I know how many is enough? Well, we'll get into that later if you care to see. Okay, I've chosen my lessons. Now when I want to study them, come to the dashboard, uh, click the little triangle down here, it says my self study, click that, and now it brings up all of my bookmarked lessons. Now normally it would show me the lessons I had just bookmarked, but I had already studied them, I had marked them as studied, so they're not gonna show up here. But if you haven't studied them, they'll show up here. Instead what it shows, shows me are lessons I have bookmarked that I have not studied and I'm studying advanced lessons right now so that's what all these are so when I'm ready to study I come here unfortunately right now anyway it has them in the reverse order that I want them so the most recently bookmarked lesson is this one here and that's not what I want to do I want to go to the one that's oldest that I bookmarked the one I bookmarked the most long time ago which would be that's the next lesson I'm going to study and then these are the ones I'm going to be studying the next few days so that's how I choose Chinese pod lessons and then how I find them when I'm ready to study. Now let's move on to the rest of the things I want to talk about. Why I do this. And uh, if you are not interested in this topic, please do feel free to stop now while you're ahead. Curriculum is typically done in a very linear format. You first study lesson one then lesson two, then lesson three. It's like a chain. Each link follows the other one. It's supposed to go in a particular order. Uh, this is pedagogically sound. You're supposed to teach what is unknown based on what is known. Well, how does the teacher know what is known? Well, if you follow that progression, lesson 15 comes after lesson 14, you can be assured that you're going to be teaching the unknown based on the known. Uh, but this brings us into a big issue in curriculum development and that's this 10 year revision cycle. Uh, I used to work for a curriculum development company 
and we were doing multimedia and we talked about this a lot this 10 year revision cycle it had everybody pretty stressed out what happens is this curriculum is made and boom the whole thing all comes out at once and then it sits on the market for 10 years before it gets replaced and during those 10 years the whole thing is being redone and since people have been working on it 10 years and then boom it comes out one day a whole lot of the content is not brand new so maybe this link here is two months old it was rushed together at the last minute well maybe this link over here is five years old I mean it was put together a while ago and maybe that link over here maybe that's nine years old it's been sitting on the shelf all this time because you've been working on this new release for 10 years most of it is actually going to average around five years old so by the time the curriculum hits the shelf it's already five years old on average so Chinese pod wanted to fix this problem and here's a classic example of a good reason to fix the problem the word gay li this was really really popular in China everybody was saying it and Chinese pod came out with an advanced lesson gay li and what look when it was published it was February 4th 2011 I will bet you this lesson was written less than a month before it was on the website and people were studying it and they were going out with their Chinese friends and saying Jun Gei Li and their Chinese friends were saying whoa your Chinese is so good where did you learn that and of course Chinese pod that's always the answer in fact my wife is Chinese and I learned stuff on Chinese pod that I tell her and she didn't even know that. She's like, where did you learn that? It's like, no, oh, Chinese bot, of course. And so this comes out and people can study it immediately. You know, if this were a traditional curriculum on a 10 year cycle, okay, 2011, we've written a lesson on Gay Lee. When is it actually going to hit the shelf? Well, may, on average, maybe five years later, 2016, it hits the shelf and people are learning Gay Lee. Well, guess what? By 2016, people aren't really saying it that much. This is now 2019. Uh, you hardly run into it at all anymore. I mean, it, it happens, so it is a good word to know. And you know what? If the curriculum came out 2016, it's going to be sitting for 10 years waiting for a revision. So it's going to be teaching Gay Lee until 2026 when it finally gets replaced with something else that's actually five years old. You see the problem. So there are tons and tons of terms that come to traditional curriculum way too late this is the problem with the traditional curriculum revision cycle it's always arriving at the party after everybody else has gone home so you got all these words uh, like john Pazin has written a blog post about one of the words that was an inspiration to creating chinese pod shoji the word for cell phone no chinese curriculum taught anybody how to say cell phone which is ridiculous so they came up with this idea of uh, completely revolutionizing curriculum by creating a chain not of many 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 small link links but six big links just have six big links and then on those six big links pile up lots and lots of lessons one by one each week publishing new ones at that level so after 10 years you've got a very very full curriculum and as time goes on you can keep revising it instead of once every 10 years you revise it every week and so people stay up to date and you avoid this huge nightmare of the uh, curriculum revision cycle so that's what this was created to do and it has some tremendous benefits but it does have some pitfalls too as we will get into so how does it work what was it designed to do well here's what it was designed to do how do european people learn english you can ask them and i am 90 percent sure that they'll, one of the things they'll say is we watch american movies American movies are very accessible. Um, if you are from a background of a romance language, English is very similar. So you can uh, watch these movies and absorb a lot and learn a lot, even if your level isn't very high. In Chinese, it doesn't work like that. Chinese media is 
obscenely difficult for a Westerner to break into. So Chinese Pod came up with a six level system to get a beginner all the way up to the point where they can start learning Chinese on their own from real Chinese media, uh, from watching Chinese movies, from listening to Chinese audiobooks, from reading Chinese novels, and yes, if you want to, you can even read Chinese news. Um, and the approach was to set six different sizes of gears for this machine that they would build, manufacturing six different sizes of gears that would step you up to real Chinese media. So here are some pros and cons of this factory approach that Chinese Pod took. The pros are immediate updates. You eliminate the 10-year cycle. It's learner-centered. The learner can choose anything he wants to study. I mean, the motto from the very beginning was Mandarin on your terms. You choose what you need to study because the lessons are designed in such a way that you don't need to follow them in any order. You follow them in any order you want, and the experience is the same. Uh, next is community-centered topics. Uh, you know, with traditional curriculum, it's a teacher trying to think, okay, what would be interesting? Sitting at her desk, typing on her computer, trying to figure out what students might want to know. Well, with Chinese Pod, it was a huge community of uh, native English speakers or other expats in China struggling with the language living their daily lives trying to figure out how do I crack this nut of the Chinese language to make life work and giving those topics to Chinese pod and Chinese pod developing topics often very quickly for these people giving them the real language they needed right away which created a very vibrant and lively and close to life curriculum next very timely so if Shuang Shiri is coming up, so in October you can prepare a lesson on Shuang Shiri that's coming up in you know November the 11th. And you know everything in China changes so quickly. What's the big deal about Shuang Shiri this year? Well, this bit past year it's just become it's incredible. This one day last year is the world record for commercial transactions on planet Earth. Did you even know that? Have you been talking with your Chinese friends about it? Well, if you follow this approach to curriculum development in October, you can prepare people to be able to talk with their Chinese friends as Shuang Shiri approaches. The same with uh, Spring Festival. You can talk about the Chunjie Wanhui. It used to be that everybody watched it and it was funny. Well, now nobody really watches it because it's a joke that's not funny, but everybody watches it anyway just because it's kind of a tradition and it's like Americans with uh, the old tradition of giving fruitcake nobody wants it but everybody used to give it and so that's a really fascinating topic you could prepare a lesson in early January to prepare people to talk with their Chinese friends about what they think about the Chunjie Wanhui so it can be very timely well here are the cons the learning path is less clear the learning path is there. I mean, I'm going to get into this later on. The learning path is there, and I think it is clear if you understand it, but it is less clear than just one, two, three, four. These are the lessons you need to do. Um, also, this really limits what teachers can do. It gives a limited pedagogical amount of variety. It gives the, can give the appearance of being stuck in a rut. Well, you always do lessons that way. Well, yes, if if the lessons are all going to be interchangeable with each other, they've got to conform to a certain level of consistency between them. So it limits the kind of pedagogy that teachers can use. It requires tight team unity. Everybody's got to be on the same page. Otherwise, they're going to be producing different kinds of stuff that doesn't match. And students are going to be frustrated, which brings us to extremely tight tolerances. Now I'm going to get into what I mean by tolerances a bit later. Uh, basically, level drift has to be avoided. With this kind of a learning system, level drift is the death sentence. It will ruin the system. So if you start a level and you get good lessons, you will find that it's like a very nicely designed machine. Each lesson is like a separate gear, and each lesson 
is exactly the same design, same size of gear, so that they're all interchangeable, but they all fit together to drive you to the goal of being prepared for the next level, to then drive you to the goal of being able to learn from Chinese media directly. This is the goal. Chinese Pod is a speaking course focused on getting you ready to interact with Chinese media for yourself. It's a speaking and listening. Um, now here's what I mean by tolerance. It's an engineering term. I work in a factory. We deal with tolerances a lot. And an engineering tolerance is the permissible limit of variation in physical dimension or any other kind of details that need to be consistent. Um, some of the tolerances we deal with is we've got a spec that's 8 microns. And if it's 10 microns, it's a problem. If it's 5 microns, it's a bit of a problem. So we run very, very tight tolerances because of the nature of what we're doing. Chinese pod, because of the nature of what it does, has to run extremely tight tolerances at each level. Why? Because these gears have to be interchangeable. They are equally spaced. You know, here in this little diagram I've created, they work together because they are exactly the same. There's no particular progression. So if, it's the, if the machine is designed correctly, you have to be able to take the last lesson you do at a level and the first lesson you do at a level, switch them, and it makes absolutely no difference in your student experience at all. That is not easy to do. Uh, 2008 through 2014, the tolerances were held very, very well. The more I study these lessons, the more impressed I am. The more I study these lessons, the more I think, wow, this is a Steve Jobs kind of accomplishment. And that's why I call the, I personally call these the Apple years at Chinese Pod. What about the ones before that? Well, 2005 through 2007, eh, not so good. Especially 2005, 2006, those lessons are a mess, quite honestly. They are not easy to use in terms of a system. Some of the lessons are really good, especially 2007. 2007 was pretty good, but it's overall not a user-friendly experience. That's why I call these lessons the DOS years. Now, I do want to modify that a little bit. You know, 2007, I think, was pretty good. So 2005, 2006, the DOS years. And I have to also say lately, I've done some 2014 lessons, and I've discovered I don't know quite what happened, but the quality went down. The consistency of the difficulty level uh, seemed to slide. So actually, I'm calling 2008 through 2013 the Apple years. So if you want to look for... The Apple years, 2008 through 2013, that's where I try to stay. Now, why do I try to stay there? Were the lessons after that bad? No, but something really, really important happened in January 2015. Now, that is when the office moved from Shanghai to Taiwan. That's not what I'm talking about, although that was a factor in this. The big, big thing that happened was this. We've got six levels here to get you up to real Chinese media the highest level is what? Media. Media disappeared. Chinese pod stopped making media lessons. Uh, you look at this machine and that leaves us with a problem here. What is it? There's a huge gap between advanced and real Chinese media. And so people start complaining Chinese pod is too easy. Well, of course it's too easy if the hardest level is missing, but instead of you know, replacing that level, they moved the goalpost. Advanced moved upward to become harder. Well, that created another problem. Can you see what that is? Yeah, upper intermediate is now too easy. So it had to be moved up as well. Uh-oh, new problem. Domino effect, intermediate. Too easy. It got moved up. Okay, we have another problem. But, I mean, there's only so much, I mean, people are complaining the newbie is too hard if they're a totally beginner. 
uh, we're kind of stuck. What do we do? The poor elementaries are screaming, I can't make the jump to intermediate. It's too big. Well, yeah, it's too big. So, da da da, new level, pre intermediate. So, here is the system we've got from 2015. Is this a bad system? No, it's six levels. That sounds good. Is it the same system we had before? No, it is a different system. That is a problem when the lessons all have to be interchangeable. Uh, so that's why I actually refer to lessons produced after 2015 as the Linux years. They're not bad lessons, but it's almost like an open source project where there was no control to create a uh, unified student customer experience. It's, it's just not unified anymore. And this is how it shows up. You've got your machine here, runs nice and smooth when all the gears are within their tolerances. They're all the same size, same shape. But what happens if you start plugging in gears from another system? So let's say you get rid of one of your Apple years lessons and plug in a Linux years lesson. It doesn't match and that one doesn't match and that one doesn't match and when you try to run your machine you've got some problems in fact students who do this and I, I experienced this immediately when I try to do some of those for me newer lessons anything after January 1st 2015 I considered new and when I started trying to do some of those I felt confused and frustrated. I didn't know what was going on. It wasn't until later I understood, oh, this is what's going on. The levels have changed. And this creates confused, frustrated students who start to feel like there isn't a clear learning path. Well, there was. It's just gotten a bit muddled. And so here are the reasons I only do Apple lessons. The consistent experience across a level the minimal confusion and frustration. You know, I'm middle-aged now trying to learn Chinese. My tolerance for frustration is very low. Predictable number of lessons needed at each level. I think this is really important. This is something that's been lost uh, because of the level drift. Fun and interesting dialogues. I think the dialogues actually are more fun and interesting back then. And the quality voice acting. They had some amazing voice actors back in what I call the Apple years. And this is what I'm talking about in terms of being able to predict how many lessons you need to do. There is this fantastic tool on the dashboard called Progress. It tells you number of lessons and it tells you how many is recommended for each level. Now you need to understand what that means. That doesn't mean that if you do 50 newbie lessons, da 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 da, you are now elementary. <laughs> Not necessarily. What it means is that that's how many of the full lessons you need to hear in order to get a complete understanding of what you need to know from that level to move up to the next one. So if you've heard 50 newbie lessons, you're not going to benefit intellectually from hearing more of those full lesson explanations. You're just going to hear the same explanations over and over and over. Uh, or at elementary, 80. After you've heard 80, um, you've heard all the teachers have to say. Uh, I mean, this is this is an incredible accomplishment to me. This is amazing. Uh, the more I look back over this, it's like, wow, that Shanghai team, they thought about all of this very, very carefully. Uh, now, if you look at the newbie column, how many did I do? I did over 150. Why? Well, I needed more exposure to the language itself. So once I did 50 full lessons, I I quit listening to the full lessons. I just went straight to the dialogue, straight to the expansion sentences, the uh, uh, exercises, the lesson review vocab, the lesson review of all the vocabulary, and I would do maybe instead of doing one full lesson a day, I would do three of those a day, up until I I passed 150, and it's like okay, I'm ready for elementary. So these numbers are useful to help you know when you're ready to drop out of listening to the full lesson, and then for me. A general rule of thumb is I then do that same number two times over of just the dialogue and the exercises and the lesson review. So 
a bonus slide here, signs that you're halfway through advanced. I've done uh, now almost three quarters and this is what it's like and this is consistent across the levels that you get comfortable when you're about halfway through. I can read the dialogue fairly fluently. The vocabulary list has 10 to 15 unknown words now at my level. That's not too bad. The dialogue contains two to five unknown characters. You know, that's, that's a comfortable amount at my level. The expansion sentences have three to five unknown words. You know, again, not, not too difficult. Expansion sentences may contain one or two unknown characters. Yeah, that's, that's good. No, no, no big deal there. And the final result of this is that each lesson, every single lesson, with the only exceptions were lessons produced in 2014. All of the other lessons, without exception, they comfortably, comfortably present new words and material without frustration. So I know uh, every day when my alarm goes off at 4.45, I'm going to meet with my tutor on WeChat from 5 to 5.30, and I know we will have enough time to cover the dialogue, the vocabulary, the expansion sentences, and have time to chat about the material, and it won't be too hard for me, but I will learn new things, and it happens day after day after day with rock solid consistency. And that is why I stick with those Apple lessons. That rock solid consistency is deeply motivating for me. The fact that I can count on what I'm gonna get. And I don't need to think, oh no, is this gonna be a really hard one? And I don't have to think, oh no, is this gonna be a really boring one that's too easy? No, they're all the same. So, that's not to say that you should uh, do what I do. I just want to share with you what works for me. If something else works for you, great, do that. But if you're new to Chinese Pod, this is what I tell everybody to do until you're comfortable with it to branch out, try other things, and, and be willing to deal with the differences in the systems between the years. Anyway, if you have stuck with me this long in this video, you deserve a purple heart, and I'll see you next time.